Two small matters before we start today. First, I'm sick, so I'll sound a bit funny, but I really wanted to get this video out this week. Second, there's an elephant in the room. This week, Donald Trump won or stole an election. I don't usually talk about electoral politics, but now more than ever is a time for mutual aid and direct action. Please learn about these things and go out and fight, because millions of people are at risk from this new government. Like millions more than already were. Your anger and hatred for the authoritarians and bigots who won the election are there to motivate you to action. If nothing else, now we can finally put to rest the idea that elections and parties and constitutions somehow prevent the shitty people with terrible ideas from taking power. When the reality is obviously that they pave the way to power, so anyone with enough money can do whatever they want to whoever they want. But that's not what we're talking about today. I'll let everyone else talk about that and get on with things that matter regardless of which group of assholes tries to rule you. Let's talk about rights and freedoms. Everyone says they believe in freedom and have the right to do things. But do we? What is freedom? What is a right? We don't ask these questions enough because we assume we know. But if it's such a simple question, that might mean we're letting other people define our rights and freedoms for us. As a result, any freedom we have is freedom we're allowed. Any rights we have are conditional. Where do rights come from? Common answers include God, human nature, and the state. The first two are great topics for abstract philosophy, but only the state has the power to uphold rights on a systemic scale. So how does it use that power? When we think of the state, most people in democracies think of democratic, representative government. They might think of it as governed by a constitution in which a number of citizens' rights are promised, and that constitution compels the state to work for the people. The thing is, whatever rights are, the purpose of the state is not to protect them, at least not for most people. The state concentrates and exercises power on behalf of the people at the top of the social hierarchy. In other words, it takes away our freedom and converts it into power over us. Then the state forces everyone it can into a social system designed to benefit those people at the top of the hierarchy who own everything. During this process, it could be in the interest of those with power for the state to secure the rights of some of its subjects. But whatever words it uses, the state retains the right to override your rights and impose the will of the ruling class on you. And unlike you, the state has police and prisons to enforce its right. Of course, the more money you have, the stronger your rights are, and the more you have of them. If you're wealthy, you can travel where you want. If you have a few hundred dollars, you can buy a passport, so you might be able to cross a border, depending where you're coming from and going to. If you have no money, you don't have permission to go anywhere. The strongest right under a capitalist system like ours is the right to property. However, most people don't own property. They have homes they rent or pay tax on, products they consume, and a handful of possessions. They don't own corporations and buildings and land, so the state doesn't have to protect them. What use are rights to people who can't afford them? Because the other side of money granting rights is lack of money destroying them. Police hang around poorer places, especially black neighborhoods and native reservations, enforcing economic segregation, looking for people to feed to the prison system. Crimes of poverty are more harshly punished than white-collar crime because poor people are supposed to be out there working all the time. If you're driving, and you speed, and drive drunk, you might just get your license taken away, even though you could easily have killed someone. If you steal a TV from a Best Buy, which couldn't possibly hurt anyone, you might have to go to prison. Same with making money from the drug trade. Years in prison for you, a slap on the wrist for a big corporation. If you're poor, one lawsuit or criminal charge can ruin your life. Meanwhile, Donald Trump and Elon Musk are embroiled in dozens of lawsuits and criminal charges, and they're still among the most powerful people in the world. But the promise of rights and freedoms is central to the ideology of the modern state. Since the end of World War II and the founding of the United Nations, protecting rights has been a major excuse for the continued existence of the nation-state. Many or most states nowadays have lists of rights and freedoms they say you have, and even if they didn't, the UN has a long list of rights it says are universal anyway. 
The UN says rights are universal and inalienable, which implies to me it wants us to view them as an unattainable ideal. But maybe it's just reflecting popular belief. So the state has to simultaneously promise it will guarantee your rights, and yet be seen to be justified when it violates them. If I have power over you, I want to make you think it's in your interest and for your benefit, or at least that there's an upside and things could be much worse. So I'll tell you, you have rights and freedoms, limits to my power over you, and I'll be the one who defines and enforces them. If you only have freedom to the extent I decide, I can also decide when you don't deserve freedom. The exception, when it's no longer a question of freedom, but of protecting the children or saving the republic. Because rights are set by the state, and because dividing people is integral to wielding power, rights distinguish between people who have them and people who don't. That includes human rights. Who doesn't get human rights? Criminals, suspected or convicted, whoever the state designates a terrorist, people crossing borders without all the right stamps, and whoever we decide doesn't deserve rights tomorrow. Plus, animals obviously don't deserve rights, even though they can suffer just like we can. It's not an accident we treat other groups so poorly when we believe in rights for ourselves. The nation state, you know, your country, insists on splitting us into groups. So we have insiders who deserve rights and outsiders who deserve violence. If you have rights for citizens, then non-citizens are denied those rights. Do the people in cages on the U.S. border have rights? Apparently not. The only right they had, right this way. <laughs> into the internment camps. An outsider can include citizens if I think their behavior doesn't reach my standards. If you have rights for people who follow the law, you can do anything to people who don't. Do unarmed, suspected criminals who get shot by police and security guards have rights? Apparently not. They gave up the right to live when someone suspected them of committing a crime. But if your job is enforcing the right to property, you have the right to kill. According to Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, I have the right to freedom from unreasonable search and seizure and cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. But who defines all these words? Who decides what's unreasonable? Who decides what's cruel? Politicians, judges, and police? I trust them like I trust food sold by Mr. Beast. I would call kicking people out of their homes cruel and a clear violation of their human rights, specifically Articles 3, 5, 12, 13, 17, 22, and 25 of the UN Charter. But the Canadian state defends the rights of landlords, who it helps every day to evict people. I would call homeless sweeps even crueler, as enforcers destroy whatever tiny amount of comfort homeless people were able to squeeze out of their days. Yet here we are. I also have the freedom of peaceful assembly, except in practice, because actually you need a permit to assemble legally in this country. You want to get in a group in public? First, you have to fill out forms saying exactly what you're going to do, then make a couple of phone calls, pay a fee, and wait for permission. So if you can't afford it or don't get permission, you don't have that right. To me, this is a perfect illustration of how rights really work. You can't just do what's written down just because it's written down. Your rights are still subject to official approval on a case-by-case -case basis if you can afford it. And actually, the Canadian Bill of Rights says that too. The right not to be deprived of these rights except by due process of law. So you have inalienable, ironclad rights and freedoms, unless the state wants to take them away. The state works for whoever pays to use it, like corporate lobbyists and well-funded pressure groups. Anti-trans activists in the US and UK have pushed for the state to come up with a definition of woman so they can have sex-based rights. What they're really doing, and they know it, is limiting who can be called a woman and thereby limiting who gets the rights they pretend to believe in. They're capitalizing on a scarcity mindset rhetoric, saying there aren't enough rights to go round and therefore we must prioritize cis women over everyone else. That's right out of the right wing's playbook when they say, let's prioritize citizens over non-citizens. Let's prioritize white people over people of color. 
Rather than giving anyone rights, the effect of transphobic legislation so far has been letting police into women's bathrooms to eject women who don't conform to the officer's idea of femininity, and authorizing adults to inspect the genitals of school children. But don't worry, it'll be right-wingers in charge, and obviously you can trust them around kids. Oh. Uh. Oh. Oh. Ooh. Uh. Uh, um. Uh, oh. When you name a right or freedom, like freedom of speech, you run the risk of letting other people, like the government or other fast-talking hucksters, decide what exactly that means. Freedom of speech means you're allowed to say anything you want, unless the government says you're not allowed to, or the social media platform bans you, or if you're at work. What rights we have in what situation is determined by authority. We have the right to a fair trial, in theory, but what constitutes fair is in the hands of the judge. If the judge thinks trying children who don't speak English with no lawyer present is fair, then the outcome of the trial is binding. Hey, those kids had the same right to get a law degree as the rest of us. So when we talk about what rights and freedoms the state should permit and uphold, we're asking the wrong questions. Instead of thinking about which freedoms people should be allowed, as if we were so wise we were able to decide that for other people, why not assume we should have total freedom to do anything, as long as it's consensual for everyone involved? For any disputes that come up, we can talk them out and reach an agreement, bringing in other people if necessary. To an extent, that's the way things work now among civilians. But that arrangement wouldn't empower people to coerce others and make it seem legitimate, so it's not the correct, official way to resolve disputes. You're supposed to put the right to decide your fate in the hands of an authority working for a system that seeks power over you. I don't want a society of rights written down by a self-interested authority. I don't want to fight for specific rights and freedoms to be permitted, defined, and denied by the powerful. I want to see power decentralized, so no one can inflict their moral code on everyone, and anyone can hold anyone else accountable if they hurt someone. We shouldn't separate ourselves and set up hierarchies when we're all equally worthy of respect and freedom. When you respect people, you don't need someone else to outline your rights and duties toward them. You talk things out. What we really want, what everyone wants, is freedom. Not freedoms that you can list and qualify and make exceptions to. Freedom. You can think and read about what freedom is, how much we have and how we lost most of it. Subscribe to this channel, that's like all I talk about. You can also fight to take your freedom back, to liberate yourself and those around you. We should be building a global movement for the full emancipation of everyone. Some of us already are. If you can find us, you can join us. In my next video, we're going international. How human rights are used to justify war. See you then.